So my question is for Mr. Hulsman. Uh, in his last slide, he uh, made a conclusion that uh, polytheism and relatives, relativism emerges from coercive democracy, and I just wanted him to expand on the causality here. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. I must say, it was a very hypothetical statement. I just took it from empirical reality. Uh, uh, the, the Greek republics were typically characterized by polytheism, uh, uh, and I, I mentioned that Socrates, uh, Plato, Aristotle result, uh, revolted precisely against this. I uh, find the same thing in, in, in Rome. Uh, we find the same thing in, uh, in the, within the Germanic tribes and, and elsewhere. And I think that the connection is that um, uh, the, uh, the appeal to uh, religious authority, which were typically ancestors, right? So it's this book by um, Fustel de Coulanges in, in the uh, 19th century, right? On uh, uh, the, the, the uh, city of antiquity, right? In which he describes the religious uh, sentiments of, of the Romans and Greeks and so on. It was an ancestor cult, essentially. So how does it come that the people uh, come to refer to the same authorities. And I think that's, it's, it's a consequence that results from discussing things eventually. So it's a kind of philosophical enterprise that is more led, uh, well, through, through exchange, discussion, and so on, and which was uh, concentrated in Athens as an intellectual uh, center. So you get this kind of result. But it, it, in a free society, it emerges slowly, right? It comes essentially uh, in, a, in a slow process. And it can be accelerated or uh, also imposed by um, uh, monarchical political coups, right? A monarchy would typically prefer a monotheistic uh, regime. And that's why in, in the uh, Christian Middle Ages and also in the, in the early modern period, monotheism was considered to be a characteristic feature of a civilization. And people have brought it to realize, well, there's only this one God. Right? So I think that to the extent that um, uh, society under the uh, pressure of the democratic forces that I've uh, described, coercive democracy, uh, revolves back to um, a, a more primitive state, well, it becomes more natural that, uh, well, uh, people settle back to some sort of relativism and polytheism because they, they, no longer, uh, they are no longer interested in questions of truth, right? The decisive question is always one of decision and of compromise. So then you don't spend uh, time on the question of truth. Is it true that there is only one God? But the question is, okay, I mean, you believe in this God, I believe in this God. What the heck? Uh, okay, let them include all in, in our pantheon and everyone here has his place so, so we make everybody happy. That, that, I think that's the praxeological argument I would propose. Um, my question's for Saif, or I guess if anyone else cares to answer. Um, so could you, I guess this is coming from an American perspective, but could you comment on interest rates, I guess over the last decade, what your impression is and where, if there wasn't a central bank, where the market interest rates, I guess how they might have behaved differently? So I think it's very difficult to, to uh, pass judgment on interest rates in a fiat environment because they are the products of central planning. So central banks basically decide the interest rate because they buy and sell bonds in a way that brings about the interest rate that they want. And of course, they have a monopoly on the creation of the money, or at least they and their banks have a monopoly on the creation of the money. So they can uh, control the money supply, they can control the price of money, and so they can impose an interest rate on society effectively, like a situation of price controls. So it's a bit like trying to guess what would be the price of potatoes in a situation where you have a central planning board for potatoes. It's difficult to tell because if the central planning board wasn't there, then the entire potato industry would be quite different. So the answer that I would say is uh, I, I wouldn't have clear, clear answers to specific short-term uh, interest rates. I wouldn't be able to tell you that you know, in the year 2000, interest rates should have been at 6%, but they were actually at 3 or something of the sort. I don't think you can make something like that because it's a, it's, it's a constantly shifting uh, policy that the central bank follows. But I would imagine that if there hadn't been a central bank, then you would have hard money, so you wouldn't have inflation, and so people would have a lot lower time preference. And so interest rates would likely decline over time. 
And I mean, it depends on when in your hypothetical you want to not have the central bank. Should we just not have central banks from day one, or we got rid of them last week. So it depends. But you know, the the uh, longer we've had without central banks, then I would imagine the the lower interest rate would go. I think. Well, I, I would like to add that in a fiat money regime, the market's interest rate would be lower than it would be in the absence of a fiat money system. Because in a fiat money system, as you know, banks create money through lending, so they increase the credit supply, push down the market interest rate below the level that would prevail without uh, such a increase in, in bank credit uh, in the absence of a, such an expansion of bank credit. So possibly the idea would lead to the conclusion interest rate would be somewhat higher than they are under current conditions. But then the world would look very different. Maybe there would be tremendous changes when it comes to savings and investment uh, demand. So it's really hard to say where the interest rate would be. My take would be interest rate would be somewhat higher. Yeah, under the current regime, of course, you, you, you can make uh, ne negative, negative interest rates because you can always re recover your losses by printing up additional sums of money. Uh, so even, uh, even though the rate is below zero, uh, if you, if you are in position of uh, the institution that produces money, losses are not losses in the same sense as they would be for private individuals. Anybody else? No? I have a question for Saif Dien. Um, so you are saying that in the process of civilization, the social time preference rate falls, and it, uh, at some point it reaches, or the nominal interest rate reaches a level where it equals the cost of uh, money storage and the risk of losing it. But what about the risk premium and the nominal interest rate? Would that not prevent ever falling the nominal interest rate to the level of, of the cost of holding money? I mean, I think there is a risk premium on uh, lending the money. There's also a risk premium on keeping the money. So it's entirely conceivable that the risk also declines. So there's the cost of holding the money and the risk of holding the money. And then there's a the cost of lending it. Now, with time, and as time preference drops, you would expect that the risk of default and the risk of um, uh, taking the money and running away would also keep declining over time because people are lower time preference, more and more, more likely to commit to their contracts. So I'd still think the more we lower our time preference, eventually the time preference needs to go below the cost of storage. Well, I think you do not even have to come up with the idea of storage costs. You just have to think about the deflationary monetary regime. Let's say prices decline by 2% over time. So that would be a negative inflation premium in the nominal interest rate. And if the underlying real interest rate would correspond with a positive sign with the decline in prices, then you can have a nominal uh, zero interest rate, but in real terms, you have a positive real interest rate. That's perfectly imaginable. I think, I mean, if, if you invest, right, so there must always be an incentive, right, for you to, to forego the, the benefits of uh, having cash on hand. That is, even if you have a price deflationary situation, right, in, in, in real terms you earn uh, 2%, so in order to entice you to give up your liquidity, and uh, in, in invest in a project, you need to be paid more, so you need to have more than, than 2%, right? I mean, the, 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 um, the, the, the cost of holding money, yes, it's true, they, they come uh, into play. Why do people, I mean, right now it's also costly to hold money. Why do people still hold money? Because there are non-monetary benefits that are related with 
holding cash. Right? You're benefiting f from liquidity. You're benefiting from a good that has no counterparty risk and, and, and stuff like this. Right? That's why people hold cash, and investors today hold a lot of cash. Even though who wants to try yeah, because if if something of uh, contingency arrives in the in the meantime, you still have control over the money. That is that is uh, one of the reasons why people don't want to give up their money. The, the motive for holding money is, on one, it's some sort of uh, insurance against uncertainty, and uh, holding holding money makes it easier to deal with uh, with un. There's uncertainty, um, though I'm uh, also somewhat skeptical about this this idea that the interest rate could fall to zero. Uh, uh, it means something that, okay, if I loan the money for a year to somebody, what happens if something happens in that one year and I urgently need the money but I have loaned it out? Um, so holding ho holding money ensures you against uh, any type of contingency that arises in the meantime. And to give that up, you would want to have a reward for this because you give up this possibility of dealing with unforeseen contingency uh, for the duration of, of the loan that has been extended. I mean, I think it's fair to say that under current conditions, the major concern we all should have is that central banks keep pushing down interest rates, manipulating credit markets to, you know, get a boom going, an artificial boom that causes overconsumption and malinvestment. And uh, we see that last Thursday, the Federal Reserve cut interest rates by 50 basis points, and uh, the European Central Bank has slashed interest rates, and we are at the beginning, I think, uh, of another huge, big uh, interest rate uh, uh, cutting cycle and um, causing, of course, again, overconsumption, malinvestment. So we, we might not, well, pretty soon we might be confronted with the situation where interest rates again approach the zero line. Of course, um, that is an indication in the current fiat money regime that um, other problems, other crises uh, will follow. But I think the, the likelihood that we'll stay in extended zero interest rate territory is, uh, is diminishing because uh, uh, of the Ukraine conflict and all the, uh, uh, all the financial uh, warfare has been led against Russia uh, and all supporters of Russia. There are now a lot of countries that have alternatives, alternatives to the SWIFT uh, payment system and to European financial markets. Right? So we, are, we have been digging our own graves. Right? The, the, the reason why low interest rates could be maintained for such a long period, or more than 10 years actually in some countries, uh, was the uh, lack of any, any alternatives. And we are, have been building alternatives in the past few years. So uh, this is just, but I mean, I, I agree with, with your general assessment, but I think, I mean, the happy times for our, for our central banks are becoming shorter. Thank you. Something, something more to add to the interest question. If you look at the components of nominal interest, then uh, low time preference and hard money certainly will lead to the disappearance of the purchasing power, premium. Maybe not so sure the terms of trade premium that Rothbard came up with. Uh, and one thing that will not disappear is the risk premium if you see it as the perceived risk of not being paid back. So I think there's not only low time preference and uh, hard money needed, but also trust. Uh, I think you have to add trust uh, in the picture, societal trust, to get that component uh, to zero. And I would suggest that uh, Guido's uh, theory of originary interest is there probably a bit of a better fit. Uh, uh, Guido's theory of originary interest, because you gave the example of giving a zero interest loan to family and friends. Uh, and I don't think that's only explainable or easiest or best explainable by low time preference. I think Guido's suggestion that it may be due to uh, less of a spread between means and ends, meaning that it can be an end in itself for you to provide family and friends uh, without the premium is a 
better measure, better explanation for that. So I would try to take that uh, into account when figuring how, how it could drop to zero. And I think that also trust uh, plays again an important role. I would say yes. I think that's a good point to include the trust component, but I would say it's also uh, proxied, if you want, by time preference, because the lower time preference, the less, the, the more trustworthy uh, people are. And I would say in, um, that ultimately, the the, uh, the more you accumulate cash balances, the more the utility of a cash balance diminishes. I should have perhaps specified this in detail, but the, the utility of money, is, money is the thing that has the least diminishing marginal utility uh, because you can exchange it easily for everything else, but it's, utility still diminishes. Your first dollar is not as valuable as when you go from $100 million to $100 million and $1. So the first dollar is obviously much more valuable. So the marginal utility of money diminishes, and after a while, the more money you accumulate, um, you see the benefit from diversification away from holding the money yourself because then if your money gets compromised or stolen, all of it gets compromised or stolen, but you could diversify by um, lending to others. So you would see that how the marginal utility of lending can be positive for the case that you mentioned, which is that you uh, get some value from lending to others at no interest, but also to diversify from having all of your money in one place. The interest rate is extremely interesting. Uh, it's an extremely interesting economic phenomena. And um, I, I think it's very important to, and this is just a side comment, uh, to make a distinction. When you look at the market interest rate, it's, it consists of various components. And one component is called the originary interest rate. And that is actually the really interesting uh, component of the market interest rate. The, the normal market interest rate depends on many factors, depending on certain conditions, on regimes. But um, I just wanted to remind ourselves that, for instance, my Rothbard and in particular Ludwig von Mises came up with his uh, pure time preference theory. And uh, he says that um, the originary interest rate, which is in you and me, it cannot go away, it cannot fall to zero, let alone become negative. So whenever interest rates become very low and central banks start manipulating credit markets, uh, that is a clear indication that there is a distortion coming and uh, because we know for action logical reasons that the originary interest rate can never fall to zero. Guido, you have some comments? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly, you know, no, I did, no, I mean, then it would get technical because, uh, but I, I agree with the way Tosh put it, very diplomatic. <laughs> no. No, the, the, the difference really concerns. Um, I mean, all Austrians agree, right? There is a pure component of the interest rate, and which makes that so the, the the market interest rate is unlikely to fall to zero, right? So, what is the cause of the the pure uh, interest rate? And I've argued in, in in various works that is the the value spread between means and ends. Right. If we use any means uh, necessarily, it, the purpose of the means is to r uh, help us reach the end, so it derives its, its value from the end. Uh, necessarily, the means must have a lower value than the end. Right? So that's really at, at the origin, and I've criticized <laughs> the, the time preference theory of, uh, of the interest rate, which I believe both in the Bambavakian uh, version and in the Misesian version do not really explain that pure uh, uh, component of the time reference, but I would be happy not to go into this. Um, but you can read the paper; it's online. It's a, a 2002 paper with the title of "A Theory of Interest." Okay. You mean the one where, where the means are the end? It, and uh, the uh, the means uh, uh, in, in the case of the family loan, right, can be uh, the end. So in that case, there's no interest rate. Yeah, if there's no more interest. <laughs> <laughs> Zero interest. <laughs> Professor Hoppe, thank you for your presentation. Switching gears a little bit towards your use of the Pareto Principle 2080, can you 
elaborate a little further? If that's just a general rule of thumb, can you imagine a scenario where there's a more committed hardcore element that maybe less than 20% is required? No, the, the, this Pareto rule is it's just a rule of thumb. Um, so that is, of course, a speculation. It makes, it makes some sort of sense. That the basic idea is, is simply that uh, uh, most, most of the work is done by very few, very few people. They get the result done, and the bulk of the people, it, they don't count. They just follow along. Um, but that, that is not a strict law or anything like that. I, I only thought that might be a useful uh, guide to assess certain situations. But uh, it is the, the Pareto rule is not, not strictly speaking, a law. Uh, my question, actually I'm going to repeat my question, we already discussed this privately uh, to Professor Hilsman and uh, also second part is for Professor Hoppe. Uh, is it possible or is a non-coercive democracy possible and if it is, to what extent we, it can be maintained in a natural order? That's the second part of the question. Yeah, I I think if you recall what I said about the natural or, natural order, if that natural order uh, is in place, then then you basically have a non-coercive democracy. In uh, uh, numerous organizations that are democratically organized, for instance, but but you can exit. Um, so the uh, coercive democracy. The most most fundamental criterion of it is there is no exit option. Um, you are indeed the monopolist, and uh, uh, and everybody is participating in whatever the monopolist says. No exit option. Um, it, it's a very good uh, question, and the uh, empirical work of uh, Cochin, to which I've referred. It shows that, I mean, so they had, even in these debating societies, in these intellectual clubs, they had recourse to uh, in internal pressure and even social pressure, pressure outside of the club, for people who would not conform to the decisions that had been taken internally. Uh, so it shows that, I mean, in, in a market economy, the beauty is that you have partial agreements, as I said, right, and that's always possible. I mean, the, di the most difficult case in practice, uh, which shows that you can go beyond this, is marriage. At least, let's say, so the, I don't know exactly how it is in Islam, but in the Christian marriage is really an open-ended engagement, um, a mutual uh, obligation. Uh, that's a tough one. I mean, I mean and we, you just look at the divorce rates, I mean, you see how difficult it is uh, to keep this up uh, in practice. But, so that's really the only exception that I see, and it's just two persons. Right? So as, as soon as you have many persons, and as soon as the engagement is no longer just limited, it's virtually impossible that you get some sort of a voting democracy, not in the Misesian, Fetarian sense of a process democracy, but a voting democracy going, I, I just don't see it. I think it's completely unnatural <laughs> to, to have such a sort of a, well, I might, may be wrong. I would like to bring Stefan to the game. Um, I think life starts at conception, and I would please to 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 be arbitrary to say it starts with with birth or, or at eight months or something like this. I, I and I don't think it's a tr the fetus is a tr trespasser because a trespasser is uh, responsible for being there where he should not be. And where is the fetus supposed to be if not where the fetus is? So I see it more like a boat in the ocean and let's say a one-year child suddenly appears on your boat. Do you have the right to throw it out? I don't think so. 
Well, uh, I don't know if lifeboat scenarios are always the best way to analyze these things, but in pregnancy, which is a normal thing, um, I agree. I think Walter Block is incorrect in calling the fetus a, a trespasser. Um, it's clearly invited, at least in most cases, by the voluntary actions of the, of the parents. Um, to me, the question is, um, so, so if, if the mother has the right to terminate the pregnancy early on, it's not because it's a trespasser, it's because we would say that the, the fetus doesn't have rights yet. But we would say in the later stages of pregnancy, we deem the fetus to have rights. And at that point, the mother has positive obligations to the baby, including keeping it alive. Um, so that's the basic argument. My, own, my entire argument is like that's one way to look at it. And everyone's going to have different opinions. So ultimately, the, I think the right answer legally is to just bring the jurisdiction down to the family level, and then they make the decision. And then the law that governs is the law of the mother and the family, right? And so that solves a lot of these, uh, of these disputes. You just basically, yeah, go ahead, Guido. May, may I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Okay, so, so let's say, so two uh, men and women get together and they, 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 they make a child. Right? And then they make the public declaration, yes, we wish this child to be there and they're so, so happy and so on. Does this child have a right to uh, exist in the body of the, of the woman? In, in my opinion, you can make an argument that it does. But then that's a separate question from the jurisdiction question. Okay. Okay. So I would say that in the late stages of pregnancy, um, if there's no serious health problem, the mother would be wrong to go through with an abortion. But she's the jurisdiction, so that's the, that's the answer. Yeah, I mean, but the question is, your argument is the baby does not, is not a carrier of a right, as long as it's a fetus. No, that's not my argument. The, that, that, but that's what you just said. No, my, no, I think that in the later stages of pregnancy, you could argue the fetus does have rights, and the mother has the right to not kill it. But what's the origin, what's the cause of the, of the rights? Where do the rights come from? The potential for rationality, reason. But the potential is there right from day one. I agree. I, I know it's not an easy issue. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but his question is to me, so what do you do if somebody has an abortion? Do you treat that as murder? Would you then... Uh, be in favor of whatever executing the woman or executing the doctor that assisted. Um, I think you will. Yeah, I mean, we as libertarians, we also have to be somehow reasonable people. So you will not find anybody who said somebody has an abortion. That woman now must be killed uh, or must be incarcerated, a lifelong incarceration for the woman. Uh, that is the only thing that that concerned Stefan as far as I'm, I'm concerned. Um, we, we can call that whatever we want. The question is, what do we do about it when it occurs? Uh, and I don't think you, you, will, you, you will get some sort of significant majority anywhere in the world that would say the doctor and the woman now have to be killed, executed, uh, incarcerated, life, lifelong. Uh, even apart from things like rape and all those sorts of problems. So. It doesn't really matter what you call it. What do you do if it occurs? Um, and I don't think you would you you would plead this. This should be treated just like the case where you murder me or I murder you. No, I would not throw the first one. What? I would not throw the first one. <laughs> and not the last one. Either. Okay. <laughs> but but of course, um, under Walter Block's theory. Mike. No, I was uh, I'm saying under Walter's theory, if, if there's a woman is a surrogate pregnant woman and she aborted the baby, she's now violating a property crime against her slave owner. So maybe he could put her in prison, according to his theory, which shows how I think crazy it is. Well, but, but, but then, yeah, I mean, I, I, I see the point. I, I, I agree in principle. But I mean, now looking at practice again, 
right? There is a huge difference between a woman who out of desperation uh, aborts, okay, and she's torn and so on, and who would wish to, to punish her? Huh? Uh, but I mean, there are also ladies who do this routinely, right? Who are just, I mean, they, 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 they go on a vacation, they, uh, oh yeah, the vacation is on the wrong date, so I need to have a, a date at the, at the hospital first and get, a, get an abortion. I mean, this is, sorry, I mean, for me, this is criminal. This is really, uh, and there must be some sanction there. But what would this, what is the sanction? Know. Know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just wanted to uh, make a few uh, short comments about the, the idea that the fetus can be invited by the mother. I don't think so, because if, if you invite someone, he must accept the invitation, and the fetus did not accept any invitation whatsoever, so the analogy I don't think works well. Yeah, um, actually that's one of Walter Block's disagreements with me. He thinks that um, um, the fetus can't be an invitee, like normally every, we're all invitees here, and you could make an argument that if you invite someone to your home for dinner and there's a, a storm that pops up, you can't just kick them out and make them die, that there's like an implicit condition that you have to harbor them for a while, right, in, in times of peril. Um, and Walter's argument is that, well, the, the fetus doesn't exist at the time of the Creation Act, and therefore there no, can be no contract. But that's not, you know, the Rothbard theory of contract is a, is a title transfer theory of contract, and it views contract not as binding obligations as everyone thinks of them, but it's simply transfers of title to property. Um, so contracts have nothing to do with binding obligations. What, what it has to do with is, is causation. The element is causation. So, the, you know, for example, if, if, if I plant a, um, um, a bomb under the, in, in the woods uh, by a tree in the unowned woods, hoping that some child someday will walk across it, a landmine, let's say, and, and die, when I do this, and two years later, this little child who wasn't even born the day I committed the act, I think I'm, stu I'm still responsible for, for what happened, right? Because it's my action that caused the damage to the kid. So the question is, is a question of, of responsibility for one's actions. It's not a contract issue. So I think when you create a child which is naturally in the state of dependency upon the parents, uh, that gives right that gives rise to the obligation to support the child, and that would include not, not killing it if you don't have a good reason to, which is why I, would, I, I think you could classify late-term abortion as murder, but then the question is who should have jurisdiction over that? So that, that's why the jurisdiction issue is, arises. And, and as far as having to care for the child because it is your product, the question is then, of course, well, again, no clear-cut answer existed. For how, how long does that obligation last? I mean, uh, if you have a, if a kid, for instance, that simply refuses to do anything, just says, I'm your kid, uh, you are responsible for me until I die. And uh, to what extent do you have to support it? I don't think there, I mean, there are certain questions that, for which there exists no clear-cut answer. There exist questions for which we do have a clear-cut answer, but there exist also certain things where we must say, I don't know what the pre precise answer is to that question. Do we have to su support the kid until it is six, until it is seven, until it is 80? Uh, I hope that my son doesn't uh, expect me to support him until he's, uh, uh, I'm, till I'm 100 years old or something like that. Uh, I think that would be a little bit excessive in terms of expectation. You know? yeah. I, I think that um, in, in one of my articles I talk about uh, the reason that courts don't award specific performance in enforcing contracts, they simply say, oh, you've breached the contract, you have to pay monetary damages is they recognize that some types of contracts, or some types of obligations cannot be enforced by an order. And one would be to be a good parent. I mean, if, if you're such a bad parent that you need a judge to tell you to be a good parent, you're not going to be a good parent. I think the only way it could be manifested would be what the Roman law, or the civil, sorry, the civil law in, in Europe has in some countries like France um, and in my home state of Louisiana, 
um, is what's called forced airship, which is um, it based upon the idea that, look, if you have a child which is a no account, it's better that you have to take care of the child than society at large and welfare. So I think we could, we, could, we could say that. But basically the idea is that every child is entitled to a forced portion of, 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 of the parent's estate. So it's not like an obligation, it's just the child has a property right in some of the estate because it's, the theory is it's better for the, for the parents to have to take care of the child than, than, the, than the welfare state. So, yeah, so then you would um, criticize the American inheritance laws where you have complete control over it and the kids would have no claim to any part of your property. Yeah, I think you can make some kind of argument that until a certain age, the child has some kind of claim upon part of the parent's uh, estate. Okay. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> uh, yes, hello. Um, I actually have also a question <laughs> about the abortion issue. Um, so, Everybody seems to take it for granted in one way or another that um, because um, fe feti, fetuses, have, um, are proto-persons, they, uh, they have a potential to become a, a true person, a person meaning someone, and if it's an alien or it's a strange animal or it's a human, uh, with reason reasoning capacities and is therefore a legal entity. Yeah. Um, but and I know this argument was first made, I think, by Rothbard. But how, what was the foundation, the the, the 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 philosophical foundation? What's the argument for this? Because it is it is clearly also true that 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 from the moment of conception, this 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 potential is there. Um, um, so why wouldn't you simply um, say well the whole problem is 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 over if we if we if we say um only those um entities that truly are persons are legal legal entities so it does not include a uh, very re very retarded like so much that they cannot reason or demented elderly that really have no reason, uh, reasoning capacities, they are simply not considered legal entities and they do not have rights. I mean, I, 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 I love my grandmother and I love my dog as well, but, and I'm not going to kill them simply f because I realize that they, that, they are not, uh, that they are not legal entities. I still love them and I still care for them. So, so why not say that? Why is that, does that make me a bad person uh, for saying this? It's the most logical reasoning, I think. I think I've done enough damage by arguing for abortion until the ninth month. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of now arguing for infanticide. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'll let someone else do that. Um, but as you and I discussed, um, there is a concept called infanticide, and that means some people do distinguish homicide of a baby with homicide of a functioning adult. And I think in some sense, the Randian view and the sort of rational view, there's something to the idea that rights are for functioning adult humans that are rational. And they have to be primarily for them because everyone else that's dependent depends upon the care from the others, right? So in a sense, I don't want to say they have secondary status. Um, the closest I've found to an interesting discussion of this is in Lauren Lemaski's book, Persons, Rights, and the Moral Community. Um, he's bad on some things, as we know Hans. He's criticized Hans for being an anarchist. But uh, he's got an interesting discussion of why healthy members of a society sort of by charity almost attribute rights to the more marginal members of society, like children or, or very sick people or retarded people or whatever. Um, so, the, and he calls it piggybacking. They piggyback upon the rights of the normal people. I don't know if that works, um, but I think if we can at least uh, get the rights of it. I mean, Rothbard's, one of Rothbard's um, ways of looking at it was he said, what, the child can run away when he can say, I want to run away. But that, uh, that implies an older child who has some faculty, right? So I think Rothbard, in a sense, would say that a, a young child has rights for sure when they can say no, and they can say, I want to run away. 
before that, I think this is an area that everyone disagrees upon. But um, argumentative ethics is not a applicable to 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 um, demented elders and to dogs yeah. and to children. That's why Rothbard said, "Let them petition for their rights about animals." So. That's very important. We are here in a, in a conference by Hans Hermann Hoppe, who brought argumentative ethics to philosophy together with Frank van Dunn also. But and um, and 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 it does not apply to 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 fetuses and very very small infants. Yes, I, I mean uh, this this question. When do the when do they become legal legal entities? Um, and Rothbard's idea is, yeah, once a kid can run away from home and go to associate with another family or so, then any obligation that you have to your kid. Disappear. Um, I mean, most people would probably say, "I get that kid back." Um, <laughs> I mean, again, it depends. Depends, of course, on on the kid. Maybe with some kids, you really say, "Hey, this person, um, get the way out." But um, I mean. Uh, uh, we are again at, at, at the point where I have to emphasize again, libertarians do have answers to lots of questions, but we do not have answers to all questions that arise. And then common sense has to come in, we have to just analyze what the, what the situation is. Uh, we have to also recognize that there are cultural differences um, which are not necessarily differences uh, that are of um, you know, of decisive importance but differences that have to be recognized as uh, as existing um, again the position that Stefan has taken and with which I agree is uh, jurisdiction over these sorts of affairs by and large have to be exercised by uh, the woman and, and the family. The case that Guido brought up women who constantly have abortion almost uh, every time and and simply do not care you know I'm not sure what we would do about people like that either uh, we would ostracize them we would think I mean these are strange people we would make any effort that we can do never to give her any donation or lend any support to her um, but again, would we incarcerate the woman um, for how long, uh, forever, or just uh, impose a fine on her? Uh, those are questions that I, I don't have a patent answer to it. I don't think Guido has a patent answer to all of these. He brings up these questions and... and <laughs> And, and tries to and, and tries to make our life difficult here, <laughs> um, but maybe uh, stainless steel chastity belts. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, but we have to make sure that she doesn't have the key to the ch chastity belt. <laughs> I think there is this, uh, um, uh, Tony De Yazzi, a very important thinker, he said, uh, uh, constitutions uh, are institutions like where they do have the key to the chastity belt. That's how valuable constitutions are. 
when constitutions are supposed to protect us from things. Um, but if the interpretation of the constitution is again done by constitutional courts and so forth, then of course it is like ladies who have a chastity belt, but at the same time they also have the key to it. Um, but again, that it would certainly be a reasonable uh, solution that uh, Guido suggests there. Um, but we, uh, but again, it is not. From what age on would we do that? Does it need uh, three, four abortions to do it with a chastity belt, or is one already sufficient? Uh, and I'm sure that Nagido might be already in favor of just once and chastity belt key is thrown into the ocean, whatever, something like that. Um, as you see, these are interesting questions. And, and, uh, and, and we libertarians are, yeah, sensible people. We think about these, these problems, but we are also modest. We don't know. You know. Guido is less modest than I am, so do I. You know, he, with a chastity belt, I thought that's really a good, good suggestion. <laughs> uh, just, you know, in our next writings, maybe the next year we have somebody to, talking about the virtue of chastity belts. I was almost inclined to let this discussion of beating the unborn to death lie, since we seem to have crushed the issue. But in a libertarian legal order, we have to think about practical implementation and enforcement. So who has a legitimate claim to be the complainant in this type of case? And then who's going to pay for the surveillance of the prospective mother for 18 years and nine months, what have you, and without building a police state, is there going to be control on folk remedies that induce abortion and things along those lines? So can we have a little more discussion on the practical aspects of enforcement? Like also, like who pays for the chastity belt, for instance? <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> I mean, the, who, who would have claims the most important would, of course, be uh, parents, in particular the father, right? Then the family, family members, the grandparents might have an interest in having a grandchild, even though the daughter does not agree. Right? So family members, close, extended, and so on. They would na be natural people who have a claim uh, against the will of the mother. Uh, then what do you do about this? Well, I mean, of course, you, you're right, right? So it, it creates an impossibility. We're getting into a police state, and therefore we, we are all very reluctant to be uh, specific on this question. It must also be a commonsensical a solution. And I think one element that is very important on the way to a solution is just to reinforce the uh, economic necessity of the family. And because currently, with the welfare state, uh, it's, it's very easy for uh, ludicrous uh, young ladies, I mean, you just want to have a lot of fun, they have no responsibility uh, for ourselves, for, for, for offspring, and so on. They just have uh, 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 steamy nights and so on, then get pregnant, and then they get rid of uh, the babies and so on. They wouldn't do this without a welfare state because there's no support. Right? So they have a very strong incentive to, well, have uh, people around her take care of her uh, in, in case she's pregnant uh, in, in times of need. And that's why people typically get married. I mean, that's, that's uh, this open-ended uh, bundle of obligations that you have in a marriage is precisely what is being displaced, more or less, uh, by, by the welfare state, and to the extent that we can get rid of the welfare state, it would make a comeback. So for me, this is, uh, is, is a solution. I mean, we, we can theorize all we wish if people get paid for doing uh, stupid things and sometimes evil things. We, uh, we have an, uh, a battle up the hill which we cannot win. Yeah, and um, for people interested in this issue, there was a book written by Victor Komen. He's a libertarian science fiction writer. It's called Solomon's Knife, and it was maybe 30 years ago, but it's, it's about a future where there's something called transoption, where it's medically possible to actually take a fetus, a young fetus, out of the mother. So you wouldn't have to commit suicide. Who knows? That, that may be coming and may, 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 might make all this um, 
academic, but I would imagine a future humane liberal order, a rational society, a libertarian society, would value life, and social uh, social stigmas about sex would, would probably go away, uh, so women wouldn't feel, and, and there would be markets for baby adoption and for surrogacy, so I think that the, the incidence of abortion would go way, way, way down in any kind of uh, humane, rational society, so it would be almost a non-problem, I think, in most cases. However, we're still avoiding the issue. In terms of if we're, if we're going to label it a crime, who's going to be the complainant and who's actually going to the, do the enforcement and who's paying for those enforcement yeah, services? Hans actually directly addressed that issue in his earlier talk in, in uh, was it Romania. And, um, and that was part of his point is like, who, who's the plaintiff? Now, theoretically, you could say that let's, let's not take babies, let's take just regular victims of like children who are victims of a, a, a neglus, uh, abuse and neglect. Um, you know, you could say that uh, if, if, if children or uh, parents are abusing their children, then some family members or some strangers could have an agency that would rescue the, the kid. So they, they sort of speak on behalf of the kid. If, if, if you get to the point where there's a legal presumption that the child wouldn't want these people to be his parents anymore. So theoretically, you could make an argument that you have these rescue agencies, these, these pro-life res rescue agencies that sue on behalf of the child and prosecute the mother for, for committing abortion. But again, with my solution, they, they just wouldn't have that right because their jurisdiction would would not be able to reach into the family unit. And I think it's, it's obviously too invasive to give this, this policing power to third parties. They, how, again, how would they know if you're using herbal remedies, if you're not careful enough? So I think that's part of the problem and it's part of the reason why it should simply not be part of the legal community outside of the family. Because these, re these refuge agencies would again, again be liable for crimes that they commit if they make a misjudgment on the case. I mean, they say, oh, this child has been mistreated, I rescue it, and it turns out there was no mistreatment whatsoever. Then you have to have somebody who enforces uh, the verdict against these rescue agencies. Um, that's why I think the practic the most practical thing is just yeah it is uh, uh, responsible for uh, of the mother and the father and grandparents and all the rest of it it is a family affair and they have to hammer it out what they do. I was just thinking about the term abortion which I think is very unfortunate because it's about killing human lives. It's much easier to use the term abortion in a public debate than saying what it really is, killing of human lives. And uh, and uh, it occurs to me, the other day I saw the numbers of abortions in, in Germany. It's around about 100,000 per year. 100,000 human lives get killed every year. It's very unfortunate. When you think about the world demographics, you see that the um, number of ch ch kids, number of children per mother, that this rate comes, is coming down quite sharply. You need around about 2.1 babies per mother to sustain the population level. We are approaching fast on a global level that number, and there are predictions that sooner or later the rate will be even lower, and that's the path to extinction. It never occurred in human history that world population is actually uh, on a path of extinction. And I think we talked, and Hans talked about the cultural decline, and I think that is a tremendous problem, and that should uh, advise us to be very um, very cautious when it comes to discussing abortion and, and what to do against it. And so I think it's very, it's actually great that the, the, that the issue gets so much uh, attention in, in our session. But again, what Guido said before, we, we, we promote this type of culture by having welfare states and all of this. Uh, supporting single mo single mothers with lots of children and all of that, 
Um, but in terms of what we do about it, you just have no answer just as much as we don't have any answer. We, we agree, right? Yeah. I think we all agree here because we are very agreeable people. <laughs> um, and uh, with that remark, I can say we can all agree we should uh, uh, dis disappear now and continue thinking about chastity belt and similar things while we have some drinks and food. And so I thank you all. <laughs>